Welcome into the sanctuary of the City of Refuge Christian Church of Northwest Indiana. The Bible says in John 8, 32, that you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So get your Bible and follow along as Pastor Pernal brings forth the words of life. I have a question for you, and then I'm going to read you a portion of Scripture, but the, the question that I'm going to ask you is a rhetorical question which means that it doesn't require auditory answer and the question that I have for you is why are you following Jesus why are you following Jesus everybody understand that question so okay, I'm gonna read your part of, of scripture to support this question then we'll get into the main message amen but it says in John chapter 6, verse 22, it says, The next day, the crowd had stayed on the far, far shore, saw the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Now, you have to understand that prior to verse 22, Jesus had taken the five barley loaves and the five fish, and he had fed 5,000 men plus the women and children. It was an amazing, amazing miracle where Jesus had met their physical earthly need by feeding them because they were hungry. And it says the next day, the crowd had stayed far ashore and they saw the disciples, right? So look at verse 23. It says several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples was there. They got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They was looking for Jesus. That's a good thing, right? Isn't it a good thing to look for Jesus? And verse 25 says, They found him on the other side of the lake and asked Rabbi, When did you get here? And Jesus replied with a pointed answer. He says, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous sign. Jesus says, you all are looking for me because I fed you. I met an earthly need. You wasn't necessarily looking for me because of the power of God that's being demonstrated through my life. I asked you again, why are you looking for Jesus? Are you following Jesus? Are you looking for Jesus only because he can do something for you? Or are you following Jesus because of the, the fact that you love him and that he gave his life for you and he's demonstrating his, and you want him to demonstrate his power in and through your lives? Why are you following Jesus? Rhetorical question. And I ask that question because God wants to make sure that we get a spiritual reset when it comes to why we do what we do. Make sure we do what we do because we truly love Jesus for who he is and not just because of what he can do. Because when he do what we want him to do, the question is, will we still follow Ten, ten lepers went to Jesus to be healed. They were all healed. Ten lepers left. Only one came back and says, Lord, I want to thank you. Jesus said, wasn't there not ten of you? Why was there only one to come back to say thank you? Make sure that as God moves in and, and, and through and our lives and he's meeting our needs that our love for him has no real strings of need attached no other than the fact that he first loved us and we're giving our love back to him if he don't do another thing in our life he's done enough already and i just love you for being jesus it's important that we have that type of motivation in our attitude to jesus let's love him for who he is and not just for what he can do. Amen? Amen. He's going to be Jesus. He's always going to do what he do. But let's love him in spite of that. The fact that he saved us is enough, isn't it? <laughs> we was on the way to the devil's hell and Jesus stepped in and said, oh, not so. I'll give my life for them. That's why we want to love Jesus. 
Praise God. This, this, this was a thought that the Holy Spirit had given me this morning as we was putting this message together. You can turn your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter 1. This is our text scripture, and then we're going to go back to Acts uh, chapter 2, and we're going to continue with our message today. I'm not going to be before you very long, but long enough, amen, for God to speak to our hearts what he would have for the church to hear. Uh, in Joshua chapter 1, Verses 6 and 7 says, be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I will give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey, obey. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them turning either to the right or to the left, then you will be successful in everything that you do. We've taken a thought from this portion of Scripture, and we've started a series titled The Essence of Courage. The word came to Joshua, I want you to be strong and courageous. I want you to be strong and very courageous. Not only do I want you to be strong and courageous or very courageous, I also want you to be what? Obedient. I want you to be strong, courageous, and what? Obedient. Amen. He said, I want you to be what? Courageous. The word essence in connected to courage or courageous pretty much just means what does courage look like? How do you and I know when we are operating, amen, in the boldness and the courage that God would have for us to have as brothers and sisters, what? In what? In Christ. Because if you're going to make it in the time that we're living in right now, you're going to have to be a courageous person. Because we live in a society that is turbulent. We live in a society that says that there's no longer absolute truth, but everything is relative, challenging the biblical principles of God's word. And it's going to take a courageous people to stand up and say, thus says the Lord. This is what God says about this. That takes courage because when you tell people the truth, they may not always readily or openly accept you. They may neglect you. They may, um, they may uh, put you out of their circle because the truth that you're telling may absolutely be shaking the foundation that they're standing on. And when people don't want to change, what people then will tend to do is they will try to abort the truth that's piercing the heart. And what I want to know is are you, am I, are we willing to continue to stand on truth regardless of what confronts us as a result of the truth that we represent? Are you working with me? During this series, we had talked about a, one of the disciples now an apostle, Peter. And we had talked about how Peter um, was with the Lord, and Peter, as long as Jesus was with him, he had all kind of boldness. He had all type of courage as long as Jesus was with him. Jesus said, man, you guys are going to betray me. You guys are going to leave me. Peter said, Lord, I'll never leave you. I'll never betray you. Jesus told Peter, before the rooster crowed three times, Peter, you're going to deny me. He said, I'll never do it. And the disciples, along with him, said, no, we'll never do it, Jesus. As soon as those Roman soldiers took Jesus and they, Peter was confronted, do you not understand that just as quick as Peter said, I will never deny you, he denied him three times? Because all of a sudden, he's absent out of the presence of Christ. See, you don't ever want to operate outside of Christ's presence because all of your courage and all of your boldness will fizzle away. But as long as you're in his presence, you're okay. As long as Peter was in Jesus' presence, he was able to take the sword and cut off Malchus' ear. He was, able to, he was wanting to fight for Jesus because he was in Jesus' presence, although he was outnumbered. But as soon as Jesus was taken from his presence, all of his fight left. That's why it is so important that brothers and sisters stay in fellowship one with another to encourage one another to stay in the fight and to be bold and to be strong for Christ no matter what. One of the enemy's tactics is to isolate you from the presence of God, from the presence of God's people, because if he can isolate you, then he can 
destroy you. Because when you lose your confidence, your faith, and your trust in God, there is no covering there to protect you. Are y'all with me? But the same Peter had an experience with the presence of God, the power of God on the day of Pentecost. Is that right? And it was in that same Peter that we talked about last week that preached the gospel message to the very people that had sentenced Jesus to death. He says, you are the people that killed Jesus. We're representing that Jesus. This Holy Ghost was promised to us, and we're representing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and you all did it. And that Peter that used to be a coward, now that he's got the fullness of God's power in his life, is willing to stand up before crowds and speak. Speak the words of life with great boldness to people that he used to cower down and shy away from. Are y'all working with me? All of a sudden, this essence, what this, this courage, this boldness that he's operating on is being demonstrated and is being clearly seen, not just talked about. Are you working with me? And so then Acts one and eight says, but ye shall receive power. But ye shall receive power when? After that the Holy Ghost is come, what? Upon you. How many of y'all know that we need the power? How many of you know you need the power of God to operate in the boldness and the willingness to put yourself out there for, the, for Christ? And I'm talking about, y'all might be quiet on me, but, but I'm going to preach through this because I don't know what this quietness or what this stillness I'm feeling. And so I may have to go and break it down uh, to baby to bring you where I need for you to be in your mind. And so let, let me just share this with you. When you come to Christ, you are baptized in the body of Christ by the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God works to bring you that salvation. Are you working with me? Because of what Jesus did. But I want you to understand that there is another baptism of the Spirit over and above your salvation experience that as you be effective in ministry, I strongly consider you be open to it. Somebody said, what are you talking about? So let, let, let let me go back. Uh, Let me go back to, 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 I need to break this down, to Acts chapter 2, verse 1, because I want you to get this. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. These are people that went to this one place because before Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to wait on the promise of the Holy Spirit. They were already believers. They were already Christians. Jesus, after his resurrection, had already appeared to his disciples on three different occasions. They had already accepted the salvation work of Christ, but they wasn't spiritually equipped to do what they was called to do. So he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait on this promise. And when they was in that one place, verse 2 says, suddenly... There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like the flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled upon each of them. And every one present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the ability. It was that transitional experience that they needed in order to confront the opposition that was ahead of them. This supernatural spiritual experience of being filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Somebody said, what the world that is? Well, thank you for a live demonstration. Somebody said, what is he doing? 
Speaking in tongues and the Spirit of God give me utterance. Where does that come from? Out of my most inner being, the Holy Spirit gives me that utterance. And I want you to understand that the more you pray in the Spirit, the more fluent your spiritual language will become. And not only there's times that I can speak in the Spirit, and you don't want, may not understand it, so God will give me, amen, the message behind the tongues to speak to you in English. Because you would think that I'm a total idiot to stand before you and speak in tongues a whole hour. In fact, you probably wouldn't come back again. It wouldn't even make sense. Because it's a spiritual language between man and God, and it's a force that operates on the inside of you that every one of us are free to receive it if we want it. You got to understand that there's a whole level of boldness and courage that follows that experience. The Holy Spirit speaking in tongues is not the end all. That's just the beginning of your ministry. Because when you receive the power, that means you now receive a, 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 a strength. That means you receive ability. That means that the power residing in you, it comes from the very nature of God. Where when you operate, it is no more you, but it's the power operating through you. It's the very essence of nature of God that's impacting you to do what God has called for you what to do. To be filled with the Spirit means that you now have the moral power and excellence of the soul to do what is right and to actually live a holy and righteous life before God. I've heard in the religious circle, they say, well, you know, those people that speak in tongues, they're from the devil. Let me tell you something. I used to go to the nightclub every weekend. I never spoke in tongues in the club. I used to get high and drink every day. I never hauled off and spoke in tongues after getting drunk. So the devil must have held that back. Well, I would have had it a long time ago. It wasn't until I became a born-again believer with an attitude that I want all of God that I can get. That I had this supernatural experience that has been with me and has empowered me to do everything that God has ever called for me what? To do. We all want that deutimous power. Well, maybe I just need therapy. No, you need the power. Maybe I just, no, you just need the power. Maybe I just need to go here to this workshop. I need to go here to this workshop. Oh, maybe I need to go to that symposium and that's, no, you just need the power of God. You can be crazy in your mind and God will set you free without any kind of therapy other than the word of God. Because it's the word of God that's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Get down to the joint and the marrow what, of your bones that will change you from the inside what? Out. Pastor, why are you preaching this? I'm preaching this because I thought about Coca-Cola. Anybody here like Coca-Cola? Have you ever followed the history of Coca-Cola? I've been drinking Coca-Cola since I was a little boy. I can't drink it now because I had drank so much in my life, my kidney can't take strong drink. So my kidney has somewhat been damaged, so I can't drink Coca-Cola now. But back then, when I was a little boy, I used to drink Coca-Cola. It was good. It, was, it cost 15 cents. You put your 15 cents in the soda machine, you open a little slap, and you pull the bottle out the slap. Y'all remember those kind of soda machines? Don't, 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 date, don't date yourself. They'll know how old you are, right? You, you pull it out of there. and you. In fact, we used to get a Coca-Cola for a dime. Coca-Cola was a dime. You got to pay a dollar these days or a dollar something. But we get a Coca-Cola for a dime, pop that, it was a Coca-Cola tastes so good. But Coca-Cola got smart. They said, well, wait, maybe we'll do Coca-Cola Classic. Maybe we'll do Coca-Cola Cherry Coca-Cola. Maybe we'll do Coca-Cola Zero Calories, Zero Sugar. But even the Coca-Cola Institution got enough sense to say, you know what? We need to go back to the original Coca-Cola because we're finding that there was nothing any better than the original Coca-Cola that we make. Well, what does it got to do with church? Because sometimes if we don't be careful, we get away from the original intentions and purposes of the church and we want to add this to it. Oh, how about if we add just a little Twitter to it? How about if we add a little YouTube to it? How about if we add a little TikTok to it? How about if we just really address church up so church could just really taste really good to the people to find 
out that when church is watered down, people don't change. So God says, let's go back to the original that of church when people were seeking Jesus because of what he did. And when they had experience with Jesus, their lives were changed and they wanted more of the Holy Ghost. They didn't care about wanting more money, more, more house, want another car. I go to church to do this. I go to church. No, I just want Jesus. That will set people free. We had a lady in the first service this morning couldn't set herself down because God had delivered her from a crack addiction. She wouldn't have to sit down and had to stop and let her testify because she had this personal experience again with Jesus. We want you to be able to come to church and, 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 and if you're not living right, feel so uncomfortable. We want your heart to be beating. Man, who been talking to the Lord about me? What's going on? This don't feel comfortable. I don't know if I like this. This don't feel good. I, want you, I don't want you to feel good because until, until you can recognize that you need a risen Lord and Savior, you're not going to change. You'll keep going back doing everything you used to do. And so we need people that's courageous enough to say, you know what? I'm going to stand on the foundation of God's word. It's for God I live, for God I die. If you like me, fine. If you don't like me, fine. I'm going to stand for Jesus. That's the essence of care. Now, you can talk bold. You can talk bad as long as we're in this congregation. But as soon as you leave here and you get confronted with a situation, the essence of care is what courage looks like is when you still stand on that truth when nobody else is around. It's not what we do when we are together because we know the language. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord to you. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. And we got all of these religious responses that we give to one another. And when we find ourselves by ourselves, the devil is jacking us up. And we're sitting cowering down to the operations of our flesh and to the ways of this world. But God wanted people to say, I'm not turning back. I'm going to stand for Jesus in all of my situations from this day forth in my life. That's the type of experience that Peter had with God after he received the Holy Ghost. And he began to preach the gospel. And his first major crusade, over 3,000 people had given their lives to Jesus. And so then we come to Acts chapter 3. Lord Jesus, help me. Acts chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 1. Can we do that? You know, I, you know, I refuse to cower down. You know, I'm a pre I, I don't know when Jesus is going to come, but... I tell you, Dennis, I think I'm a priest like this to Jesus come, and if people come into the church and don't want this kind, I think they can get the hell out of here. Somebody said, he's cussing. No, I, I said, get the hell. What is hell? Everything that's not like God. Everything that wants to be, have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's, that's, that's hellish stuff. Come on, y'all. Oh, he cussed. You, you, you all say worse than that. Get the hell out the church. People sitting in church and bring hell with them. We got to get the hell out of church. Why do we got to get the hell out of church? So we got a power of God to set people free. Vance yeah. 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 McLaurin is not here today. She'll probably hear this message, but her brother-in-law died. His name was Herbert. Herbert was mean, ungodly, rebellious, cared none for God. Got COVID-19. On top of COVID-19, he had COPD. We was trying to get him saved. His Pat was trying to get him saved. Vance was trying to get him. He said, I don't want to hear that Jesus thing. They called his wife and said, you need to come to the hospital. And she had COVID. They normally will not let people come into the hospital to even see a COVID patient. And if you got COVID, they definitely won't let you in. But Pastor, can I please come see my husband in his last dying moments? This just happened a couple days ago. This is what not happened in the book of Acts. It just happened to the, in a couple of days ago. They said, yes, you can come. You're just going to have to wrap up. She went in there. She caught Herbert on his deathbed. She said, Herbert, you need Jesus. He accepted Jesus. See, 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 you, you, life situations are bringing you on your knees where you're going to accept Jesus. Where, I mean, whether you think you need to or not. Herbert got to a point where he realized life is fragile. I need God in my life. As soon as Herbert accepted Jesus, his vital signs went back to normal. I said they went back to normal. And he was able to talk to his wife. 
When Norma, when evangelist and I prayed, our prayer was, Lord, sustain Herbert until his wife can get to the hospital and minister salvation. Not necessarily he be delivered from COVID, but minister salvation. That's the most important thing. Herbert accepted Jesus. A day and a half or two later, he's now with Jesus. But God sustained him and brought him back to his right mind long enough to accept the saving work of Christ. That doesn't happen without the power of God. That was a miracle working power of God. Seven weeks ago, my wife had just finished exercising. And see, I need to start testifying because some of us, we pray for miracles and they happen every day. My wife collapsed in my arms and she stopped breathing. Her mouth was open. Her eyes was open. There was no breath in her. And I began to pray in the Holy Ghost. And my wife jumped three times. Life came back in her. And she started sweating real bad. And the hospital came and they took her to the hospital. They checked out. I said, there's nothing wrong with you, ma'am. What is that? The power of God. Yeah. Betty had a family member. And I don't forget what kid he was at the hospital. They said, Pastor, come and pray. They said, he's dying. Am I lying? They said, he's dying. Went to the hospital, prayed for that man, called the church. They said, Betty, he gone home. Am I lying or not? God's power is real. And it's time for us to operate in God's power. Well, Pastor, what if he don't get up? Well, I'm not the healer no way, but I ain't going down without a fight. I was watching the World Series, and I'm so disappointed when people sit back and watch strike three go bad without swinging. You are crazy to not at least not swing. You could have hit the ball. Right, right. You sit there watching strike three <laughs> because you're scared to swing. Say, well, well, I ain't going to pray because what if something don't happen? Strike three, you're just watching the ball go bad. Well, at least go down praying. At least go down swinging. Don't go down without trying. We talking about the essence of courage, what courage looks like. We got nothing to lose because it's not about us anyway. It's Jesus. I'm excited about Jesus. So this is old school stuff here today. I'm sorry, I'm I'm some I'm I'm normally pretty sophisticated. Are we at Acts chapter three? I'm about to close. Peter and John, Acts chapter three, starting at verse one. You there? Peter and John, spirit filled now, right? Went to the temple one day, afternoon, one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. See, in Jewish custom, they, they had three designated parts of the day that they would pray. This was the three o'clock prayer. I, I mean, if we're going to be real church, how many of you know there should be times that we have designated prayer? Yeah. Here, designated prayer is what, 6.30 to 7 on Wednesday nights and 9 to 10 on Saturdays. Did y'all know that? That's designated prayer time. Amen. And let me tell you something. If there's ever anything in your life that gets in the way of that, you should say, look, excuse me, but from 6.30 to 7, I'm praying. Even if you ain't at church. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, from 9 to 10, I'm praying. It's got nothing to be with you in the building, but when the saints get together yeah. and, and join each other corporately in prayer. Stuff will be shaken. God told Ezekiel, prophesy to them dead bones. Ezekiel been prophesy to them dead bones and breathe breath of life in them dead, them bed, them bed, dead bones begin to shake and come together. What? That happens when the saints get together and what? Pray. We've got to have corporate prayer where we're all standing united. Amen. Praying that people, I, we got family members need to be delivered. All we got to do is just pray. You don't believe that, do you? Can I read you a text? Sister, Sister, Sister Kathy, can I read you a text from this morning? I got a text. I won't tell you who the text is from. But listen to this text. It says, good morning, Pastor Pirtle and family. I want to let you know I might not be there physically, but I'm there in my heart and mind and soul. The church is on my heart, and the Lord, and the Lord, the Lord is calling my name once again. God asks Jesus, will them dry bones live? Where them dry bones live? 
When we begin to pray, we got saints that might be weak in the faith, maybe backslidden. But when we begin to pray, God will begin to call their name. It won't be because we've been begging, beating on the head to come to church. God will call their name wherever they are, draw them what back close to him. See, see, old church, Coca-Cola Coca with the cherry says, if you just come to church and let me see your face, you're okay. Look, forget that. Let's just pray God wherever they are, touch them right there whether they in church or not. The church thing is going to come. We're looking for the numbers. One little, two little, three little Christians, four little, five little, six little Christians, seven little, eight little, nine little Christians, church today. That don't mean nothing. How many hearts being changed? Y'all yeah. working with me? Y'all yeah. said, why, why, Pastor, why are you preaching so hard? Because I got a little baby back there. Are you 20 yet? You 20 yet? I got a young 20-year-old right there sitting back and watching and looking with amazement to the man of God sharing the word of God. You know why? Because the gift of God is in her. And I want that gift to get stirred in her so much she's hot digging it, dog. I'm going to be courageous enough, courageous enough to stand for Jesus. Yeah. Some of the how you know that is because a master teacher has to know everybody in the classroom and what's going on with them. Yeah. Well, how can you know that? The Spirit of God. Somebody said, he old school today. He old school today. But I want lives to be changed. This is not a show anymore. People are dying and going to hell. We need the power of God say in the name of Jesus. The song says, I won't be quiet. It's Deacon Jones' fault. And as they approached the temple, a lame man from his birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate. And one called the beautiful gate so he could beg from the people going to. Now, that, that makes sense. The man was lame. He couldn't work. So what about, it's a nice thing. Put him, put him out by the temple. Saints go in there charitable. They'll give to him and meet his daily needs. That was fine up until this point. God wanted more for him. God wanted to deal with that instead of keep getting a handout. Be able to get up and make it on your own. So let's look at what happened. So verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently. And Peter said, look at us. Look at us, man. And verse 5 said, and the lame man looked at them eagerly expecting what? Some money. He's got the expectation. The expectation level is up. But look at verse 6. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. Now, I want you to understand that Peter and John wasn't broke. It wasn't that they didn't have any money, but this is not what the lame man needed. The lame man is asking for a, a natural resource to help a natural need but now there's a transition here that says it's not the natural need you have but it you need a spiritual breakthrough and what i shared this with the church this morning i just shared with you all it's free stop being god in people's life and trying to meet all of their natural needs it's not the silver and gold you need you need something spiritual and as long as you keep on meeting the natural, they're not going to have a need to pursue the spiritual. And we got to be courageous enough to say no. <sighs> I said the essence of courage is to look somebody in the eye that you love, that you care about, that you cherish more than life itself, and say no. That's a courageous act, especially if you are a mother. A man, our hearts are jacked up. We men in town. Go ahead on. But when you're talking to a mother, that's a different story. And you've got to have enough courageousness within you to realize that what you can do for a person is limited. And that you've got to challenge them to tap into an unlimited resource. Somebody say, I think he's hearing from the Holy Ghost. Peter said, I don't have any silver and gold for you, but I give you what I have. I don't have, that's not what you need, but I'm going to give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Some of your Bibles may say that Jesus of Nazareth. Get up. Get up out of your situation, and walk. 
If you're going to get out of this situation, do it in Jesus. In the name of Jesus, get up out of this. Get out of this addiction. Get out of this relationship. Get out of this dysfunctional behavior in the name of Jesus. And you may have to snatch him out of it in Jesus' name. That takes courage. Because sometimes people don't always want it how you have to offer it. I'm just telling you. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and his ankles were instantly healed. And what? Straightened. That defective part of this man's body was fixed by the name of Jesus. You got to understand, church, the reason that we need to be, uh, we need to be uh, uh, um, strong, courageous, and obedient is because that's the basis of receiving the power that God has for us to make a difference in the lives of God's people. Amen. And it takes a lot of courage many times to stand for Jesus. Look at what happened in verse 8. He jumped up and stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. With them. He went into the temple with them. Don't you know it would be a shame for you to go out and God use you for his glory? The power is magnified. You tell them, hey, now I go to, I be, I'm normally at church this time of day. You want to see me, you see me at church. Then the people you minister to come to church and you know where to be found? That's just a question. That's a rhetorical question. He went with them. That's called discipleship that Deacon, John, Deacon Saunders was talking about. He went to the temple. He didn't go to the casino. He didn't go back to the club. He wasn't at the World Series. Brother, you coming to church? No, I'm watching the World Series. That's the current day church. That's the mindset. And I dare you, pastor, say something to me about it. That's the mindset of God's people. Well, Reverend, okay, I'm almost done, Dennis. <laughs> well, Reverend, we need to talk to you because we don't like that message you preach Sunday morning. So we have an emergency board meeting on Monday. We need for you to show up, Reverend. We voted you into this office, and we're going to vote you out. You be at the church. I wish my board would talk to me like that. <laughs> now, I got a lot of respect for the board, uh -huh. but you're going to call me to the carpet digging. Could you see Dick and Lerner and Rob? <laughs> <laughs> I know we don't like that message you preached on Sunday. You get yourself down here to church on Monday, and we're going to have the police waiting on you. Turn your keys in. I'm not a cussing person, but I might cuss that day. Who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> no, I wouldn't cuss. But that's the demonic control that's over pastors' lives anymore when they try to tell truths. And pastors are not courageous enough to stand up and tell the truth to people regardless of what the outcome is going to be. I'll call Brother Tom in a minute. Now, what y'all going to say? I get behind Tom. Now, what y'all going to do? <laughs> Not as long as I got a Tom. I ain't worried about Rob. <laughs> All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. Verse 9. And when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. What does that look like? Come here, Mia. This is Mia. It's my sister. My fellow labor in the kingdom of God. Now, it, it would look like um, back over here, Sister Ship and Lana used to club with Mia. Right? They used to party together. 
And all of a sudden, they come to church and see Mia ministering. Mia? Girl, do you see that? That's Mia. That can't be real. So they come again. They see Mia. She don't look the same. She don't talk the same. We don't. It's a to and they're sitting back with astonishment saying, what? We used to Mia. Not with a club shirt on, but with the bunny on. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? What? And they're astonished. But what they're seeing is the power of God that's being manifested through the name of Jesus. Amen. Not just in word, but in deed. And they're watching the transforming word of God take place before their eyes. And so Lana and his mama Ship is sitting back there saying, man, God must be real. That's why it's so important that when we think, thank you, babe. I just want to put you up here. You was pretty. That's why. That's her mother and her sister. I, but it started with Mia. Now it's mama and sister. and the children, and the husband. But it started with Mia. Well, where'd you get Mia from? Jail. It went from jail to coming, and now bringing mama and bringing sister. The whole family is seeing a glimmer of hope because of the change that can start with one person. And the people can sit back and say, a study. Do you know this woman drive from Chicago Heights to Portage to come to church? She's unwilling to drive from Chicago Heights to church because I see what God is doing. Am I lying? She said, I see what God is doing. I'm willing to make the drive because I'm watching the power of God change my kids. I'm watching the power of God change my kids. It's worth every moment of it. We're going back to the original fashion. I saw in the spirit. I ain't crazy. I don't be thinking I need psych meds. I saw in the spirit. How You know how when you get an old house and you want to rehab it, you knock all the walls and stuff down, down to the basic, um, to the basic studs or whatever it is? I saw that taking place in the church. God is taking us back down to the studs, and he's building us again so we can operate in the power so lives can be loved on and changed by the power of God. Amen. Oh, God. That is a place to praise him and give him glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. They was astounded. And they all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, the colony where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. He stayed in fellowship with the brothers. And that was another opportunity for Peter. You remember Peter used to be a coward? Verse 12, Peter saw his opportunity. And address the crowd. He's no more denying Jesus. He's no more hiding saying, I never knew the man. He's no longer cussing. He's sitting there. He said, you people of Israel, he said. What is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power of godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. The God of all our ancestors who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. How do you see a life change? It's not because Pastor got on pink and he preached eloquently. It's Jesus. Amen. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over. Look at the boldness. You handed over and rejected before Pilate and despite Pilate's decision to release him, you rejected his holy righteous one, this holy righteous one, and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses to that fact. How many of you know that's the essence of courage? Peter standing before the, they could have had Jesus. They could have stoned him. Don't you know they stoned Steph, Stephen? They could have stoned him, but he's confronting them with truth. 
And through faith in the name of Jesus, this man is healed. It's through faith in the name of Jesus that all of our lives are changed. See, we need to go back to the church. When people come to church, they don't feel like we all stuck up and we was born with Jesus. They need to know that we all of our lives was crappy. They need to know that their pastor used to be a drug dealer. He just didn't ever get caught. What? Yeah, I sold drugs. Corner of St. Louis and Jackson Street, West Side Chicago, running pounds of drugs up and down. Women laying in the house naked with cocaine, bowls of cocaine on the table. Back then, they, was, they wasn't just snorting coke or they wasn't just doing crack. They was freebasing, taking them two liter bottles and putting a little pipe on it. Somebody said, don't, don't be triggering me, Pastor. I'm just telling you, there was a little pipe and they sit there and people come and get high. A woman come get high just to get screwed. Or screw just to get high. I know I've seen that life. But don't tell me Jesus won't change you. From the inside out. And change your whole mindset. And we got to have a church full of people. When people come in, they don't feel so condemned to be in church. Oh, come on here, baby. We always mess up some kind of way. Come on here. You just need Jesus. You just need Jesus. Jesus will change you. Okay. Verse 17 says, friends, I realize, I'm almost done for real now, because I, I feel it. I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. We need to understand that verse 17 principle. Because there are people in our families and in the world doing things and they really, they're doing it in ignorance. Just because now the, the blinders are taken off your eyes don't mean it's taken off their eyes. And people really don't know that they're doing things that are not right. They're thinking that they're okay because there's a loving God, and I don't have to worry about it. We all go to God and live for him forever after we die. That They, they think it. Some of us thought it. I used to go to church and have weed in my pocket and I was singing in the choir I'm just waiting on Jesus to return again oh won't it be grand when the saints go marching in then all the men would go ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm just waiting on Jesus to come da -da 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 -da. And had Colombian gold in my pocket. Depending on what weekend, it could have been Red Bud or Sissimilia. And running out to the barn or the Melon Lane as soon as church is out. That's my auntie. She know I grew up. She know where I grew up. She know about the barn and the Melon Lane. She didn't know about that kind of stuff, though, because when she see me, I, hey, T.T., I know how to show her what you need to see. Hey, T.T. Hey, T.T. T.T., you know. And we was in the club one night, Dennis, and Rob West, I don't know if you remember him and Superwolf. You remember Superwolf, though, don't you? You remember Superwolf. We from Tennessee. Rob West was Superwolf's disciple. Rob West said, we all going to hell. We sure going to hell, y'all. We had a table full of weed and, uh, and liquor, and we were sitting right by the DJ thing. Me, Bill, Freddie. I know the people. I'm telling you, me, Bill, Freddie, and Junior, sitting right there. We said, we ain't going to hell. I said, I ain't going to hell either. He ain't going to hell. I go to church. <laughs> I was headed to hell and didn't even realize it. I was sitting in church and didn't realize it. We went to the deacon of the church house and he offered her alcohol. Ain't no way I'm going to hell. Deacon, let me drink. Deacon sitting outside the church with a big old cigar. Oh, had to get me a break. Not setting good examples. And I could have bust hell all wide open, but it was in my ignorance. But I'm so glad that God didn't leave me in my ignorance. 
God didn't leave me in my ignorance. See, when you, got, when you want God, God's not going to leave you in ignorance. He's going to send somebody your pathway to, to minister to you. This old school church. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold, had, had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Look at verse 19. Just now repent of your sins and turn to God, so that your sins may be what? Wiped away. You always leave a way out for people. Look, I realize you didn't realize to what magnitude you was not doing what you're supposed to do, but now just repent. Just begin to change what you were doing and do something differently now. And your sins will be wiped away. Oh, and I'm going to close with this. I like what that next verse says. And, and when, you, when your sins are wiped away, then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. See, that time of refreshing, um, uh, Andrea, A Adrian, A Andrea, this is, see, the time of refreshing will come. That's where peace is. That's where peace of mind comes from, your comfort. That's where joy. That's why I want them to sing that song that they sing today two times. Ma making noise in the house of the Lord. I won't be quiet. I can't be quiet. Why? Times of refreshing. Let's just pour it on. Let's just pour it on. Yeah. Then the uh, times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed, what? Messiah. But it takes us being men or women with an essence of courage, demonstrating the courage to stand on our faith and our boldness to be witnesses and examples to the people that God is placing us right in the center of with the goals of their lives changing. See, remember, we're not here just because of what Jesus can do for us. We're here for what we can do for Jesus. Let's not fall in that category. You're only following me because I fed you. Let's be ones that follow Jesus because of just how much love he displayed toward us. And we want to now give it back. Come on, give the Lord a praise. We're going to get out of here today. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for speaking to our hearts and our minds. I thank you, Father, for encouraging us today. I thank you for shining light to maybe some confusing or dark areas and bringing clarity to our purposes and mindsets that we should have as believers. God, I thank you that, that the Holy Spirit has gone out and knocked on the doors of hearts today. And I thank you, God, that even now hearts are being opened to allow you to come in and to abode with us and bring times of refreshing. With eyes closed, every eye closed, could we all have just a moment with just us and God? You've heard the message. The Holy Spirit has knocked on your heart. And maybe things are not what it needs to be in your life, but you want to respond to what Peter told the people, just repent and your sins will be wiped away. You want to walk as a courageous man or woman of God, representing him in the earth. And you already said, Pastor, I want you to pray with me. I, I need to be closer to Christ. I, I need Christ in my life to the degree I've never had him before. And would you just pray with me? You don't have to come down here. Just raise your hand. I'll pray with you. Is there anybody here like that today? I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hand, ma'am. I see them. Pastor, pray with me because I know, I know I need a closer walk with Jesus. Father, you see these hands that have been lifted. You see the hearts that are open. Father, I pray that you'll come in and abide with them right now. In the name of Jesus. God, you said that if we'll just confess our sins and our shortcomings, you're faithful enough to forgive us. And right now, God, we just ask that you please forgive us. Because many of the things, Father, that we've done, we've done in ignorance, not knowing the magnitude of our wrong, but we realize now, God, that we've been majorly wrong. And we ask for your forgiveness. And we're open now, God, 
to you being whatever you desire to be in our lives. And Father, I pray for that time of refreshing to be released upon your people now. The healing and the deliverance taking place. God, I thank you, God, that your people love you more now than they ever have before. Grow us up in your word and use us, God, to be a solution to today's conditions in this world. We'll be bold and we'll be courageous. And we'll not be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Everywhere we go, we'll let people know the source of our change. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah.